Furious Driving, proud to be supported by Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the Furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. Follow the links in the description below. Hello and welcome to Furious Driving and it's only a few short weeks since Rustable, a day when, which was a really good show which all of us who were involved in organising are I think pretty much justifiably proud of. And don't forget, stick your date in the diary for 28th of September because Rustable 2 is on the way. Check our socials for more coming up very soon. However, I was brave or stupid enough to take four cars all the way up to Gaydon, which is about 150-ish plus miles each way. So 300 mile round trip in, well, four 30-ish year old cars. So yeah, brave slash stupid. Now, there's always a certain amount of attrition when you do this kind of thing. And in ascending order or reverse order of the most successful to least successful, number one, unsurprisingly, was the MX-5, which made it there and back absolutely flawlessly on a single tank of petrol. It even came back better than it left because my friend Barry, who drove it up, his son is a musician and spent the time just fine tuning the EQ on the radio. So it's now got a really good setup on the radio, which is better than it was. Volvo, unsurprisingly, also did absolutely superbly. Unfortunately though, it did take two tanks of petrol to get there and back, which is kind of why I don't really use that car very much. It's actually more thirsty than the Crown Vic. Yeah, um, but yeah, no problems, great car. In position number three is the Mini, the Y-plate Mini, the 199th car off the production line, chassis number 202. Driving an R50 is always like driving down the Vegas Strip at any time because you have so many lights on the dashboard, you kind of learn to live with them and ignore them. Turns out one of them was actually a real thing, so I'm going to sort that out. And the winner of the, oh my God, are we going to make it home stakes is not massively surprisingly, the Alpha 145. Because that decided to try and emulate the 200 VI back at the NEC in September last year by deciding to <laughs> its thermostat. Which is doubly annoying because I only changed that about three years ago and it's barely done a thousand miles since. <sighs> Thanks Magneti Morelli for the quality item. Luckily though, it did make it home. My parents were driving the Volvo, they stuck behind me most of the way until we'd ensured it wasn't dumping water at an alarming rate and it seemed that once it was actually up to speed and up to temperature, it self-sealed. So it has a metal body with a plastic insert and it appears that on the one in the car, the plastic insert is starting to unbond from the metal body. So as it gets hot, it swells up, it doesn't leak. So when you're on the road, you're okay. But when you stop, everything cools down and you've got water flowing through, it just starts to seep out of there. And every time I park the car now, I'm faced with a big puddle underneath it when I get back. So the car, MOT taxed, but out of rotation because I don't dare use it. I've just brought it the short journey back today to fix that. But first of all, I'm gonna fix the Mini because that's gonna make a mess in the drive and I don't want to be working in a big wet mess. So as I say, whenever you drive an early R50, this dashboard is basically like Blackpool Illuminations. Every light is generally on and you just, you just ignore it because it's generally just a fault code that's popped up or a sensor that's misbehaved. And the airbag is the standard one. That's normally the wiring under the seat, which has been taken care of on numerous occasions. Tire pressure was a new one for me this time, but the one that was the biggest issue was the ABS light would not go out. And even once I'd gone and got the, the big proper uh, decoding reader off my dad, that ABS light still wouldn't go out. And it turned out there was actually a problem. I and mean, who knew? The warning light actually did mean something, which is unheard of in this car. What it turned out to be, having done a reset and then driven it up and down the drive a couple of times, was that the wheel speed sensor on this front left wheel is not a happy bunny. So I've been down and collected a new wheel speed sensor, which hopefully will not put up too much of a fight. So hopefully by the end of this video, we'll have two cars with relatively easy jobs done and both ready to drive again. That one ready to drive, and this one ready to go in MOT because that is the reason I'm doing this in a, not hurry exactly, but today, because the MOT has run out on this car, so I can't take it anywhere at the moment. And I can't do that until I've changed this. Only 25 quid though, so not an expensive fix. Likewise, the thermostat, only 40 pounds on the Alpha, but a bit more of a faff to change. Right, let's get working. Now I should know better than to think, let alone say the following words. This job should only take literally a couple of minutes. I mean, it will be slower or take longer to jack the car up and take the wheel off than to change this part, in theory. Now I've done it. Ah, you can never have too many spare batteries for your D20 tools. All of these things are, of course, available on the Furious Driving Amazon affiliate store. Taking a look at which does actually help this channel an awful lot because that then feeds back a few pennies from every purchase anyone makes on Amazon, having clicked on the affiliate store. And that is a zero cost way of helping support this channel. 
and the way YouTube is currently playing, I need all the help I can get. So we are going from here, where we've got this little uh, Torx star socket down there to undo. Follow the wire back there, unclips from there with a the screwdriver, unclips from there, then goes behind the arch liner into the engine bay where we go and find the other end. Nope, I was wrong. It doesn't come immediately into the engine bay. It comes out. Well, I'm going to move the arch liner and have a look. Now, fortunately, these arch liner screws are fairly big and hefty and unscrew quite easily, unlike a lot of them, where they're just tiny little fiddly things that don't really want to come out. He says as one becomes fiddly and doesn't want to come out. These are those things that you screw through and as it tightens up, it spreads it all out behind it. Don't lose them, you will need them in a minute. Oh, it goes down there, okay. Got it, well, that's easy. It's actually about as easy to do it from underneath the car at the front as it is to pull the arch line around. But okay, let's start peeling these clips out of here. I would imagine this is the original stuff from when the car was made. What's it, 2001, 23 years ago? Wow. Torx socket, let's go find one of them. Okay, we're getting this out with a five. I've lost, I've left my uh, nice Draper 3.8 drive up at the barn. So I'm using an old one that doesn't really work properly. I'm using a five mil hex socket to get this out. And a squirt of the old good, good stuff. Right, that is now free. One slightly rusty bolt over there. So this hopefully should now, with a small wiggle, come free. Just gently working this thing out. It does not want to move, but it should pop out slowly. A bit of effort, hopefully. There we go. And that is now free. I mean, it's not impossible that this is still functional, just too dirty. Oh, hasn't it got a chunk worn out of it? That's interesting. I don't know if you can see that or not, but there's a little groove that's worn into that one, which I'm pretty sure is not standard. I hope the new one doesn't follow the same fate. Now the other end is just a blue clip. Just need to two hand at least. I'll put the camera down and do this off camera. Unclip and remove that connector and job done. Well, half done, need to put a new one in. Well, it's a little bit of a struggle, but it's free. And it's literally, as they keep on saying on all the young people's uh, YouTube channels, literally a case of plugging it back in and connecting it up. And pop this down into its little hole. Clip you in there. This old driver definitely wants to go in the scrap pile. Right, that's in there. That's all now refitted, looking shiny and nice in the same orientation as it was previously. We'll quickly drop under the front of the car where we can see, whoops, the new connector doing its connecty business. Only thing left to do now, pop the wheel back on, quick test run up and down the drive, see if it turns that light out. Well, the light is currently still on, but the proof is very much in the pudding. So we're just firing up the, uh, the car scanner and then we'll clear it, run up and down the driveway. So we should get a signal and then hopefully that light will not come back on and we'll be good to go. So we're showing a fault again. Read fault code. Wheel speed sensor front left. So clear fault memory. Done, okay. Hopefully that should now. I'll turn the car off and on. That light should go out. Clear fault memory. Quick arrays. Let's run up and down the drive. It might need to move first. So I can set this to live data, move this up and down the driveway. And you can see the other wheel sensors are recording speed. The front left isn't, which is a problem. Oh. This is, of course, my own fault for uttering those foolish, foolish words about it not being a difficult job. So I've taken the sensor in and out again, refitted it. I've undone and remade the connection over there. It can only go in one way around, so I can't have put it in the wrong way around. I'll try clearing it and doing everything again, but beyond that, I'm not sure what else I can do right now. Right, so there is a light and it never goes out. Um, yeah, that's a problem. I know you can actually use a test meter to test whether these sensors are working or not. Unfortunately, the shape of this plug and the nature of this connector means that the actual pins are right down here in the bottom. And so I can't test the old or new sensor without destroying it. And I can't get a tester onto the, the wiring loom in the car because again it's kind of shrouded so i can't test either of those particularly that easily or indeed at all <sighs> so either the new part is also at fault or there's the reluctor ring the reader ring on the wheel hub itself which is at fault 
and I'm not quite sure how to diagnose that. As I've got no more parts here right now, I'm going to move over to the Alpha and do the thermostat on that because at least I've got the part for that and that shouldn't be too... I'm not going to say it. I'm not even going to start to say it. Um, so yes, I'm going to have to come back with probably a reluctor ring for that front wheel ABS sensor and change both the components and then hopefully we'll have a system that works. Right, Alpha Mayo time. Right now, while I have a bit of a think about the Mini, let's crack on and do the thermostat housing on the Alpha, because at least I can then drive this thing some more, because this is taxed and emoted and ready to go. Uh, believe it or not, I did actually spend the morning watching my own video of how to do this from three years ago, as a quick refresher on literally how to do this from three years ago. And it's pretty easy really, there's a couple of bolts down here, a sensor you have to undo with a 13 16 spanner or something crazy. The rest of it is just small sockets and screwdrivers. How about that? For the first time I'm actually working on this car with its own actual mug. That's quite cool. That is literally this car. Right, let's get down to work. It was weird size, 13 sixteenths or something crazy. Weird and imperial. Because it, oh, it's 20 millimetres, I haven't got 20 mil. That's what it was. As I remember, I started off by undoing this big sensor at the top, 11 sixteenths, which is more or less 20 millimetres. Let's undo that so it doesn't twiddle the wire too badly. Now I did take the battery out last time, I'm hoping I don't need to this time. This is a 13 millimeter with a sort of medium long extension. I did actually get this really handy three length extension from Draper, which means you can always find pretty much exactly the right size, but I'll slacken this off for while everything's still fairly dry. There we go. Good, and the other one. Oh yeah, that's right, I couldn't get to that because the pipe, that was the issue there. Right, I'm going to work on the tubes instead. Maybe I can take something off and get a better access to it. Ooh, okay, so now the first of our, our gushings is going to begin, where things get messy. God, this hose really is welded on there after three years. Right, this bottom hose, you need to use a tiny socket on it. Now will you come free? Yes it will, oh my word, now the water comes out. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna need to do a bit of clean up after this. Bit of a hose down. And now I can get a socket on there. Excellent. I have to say, I did try and put a tray underneath this car, but because the thing is so low, being a sporty alpha, that was not an option in the end. <coughs> There we go. And there's just one more at the back to undo. It is amazing how greasy coolant makes everything. It's like working with like greased ice. Once this stuff's around the place. And just that one pipe on the back to disconnect, which is lack slackened off, but it is welded on by time. Come on you, off you get. Right, there we go. Old one off. So this is the old thermostat which is now kaput because it was leaking around this joint just here. Now you can probably see there is a lot of coolant rolling onto the floor right now. I will have a good hose up later because cats and things like the taste of this and it's poisonous. Right, so putting it all back should be relatively easy. Just a matter of replacing all the bolts one at a time as they came out. And remembering to take off the old rubber seal from the old thermostat which is no longer needed of course. I don't know how, I'm not even touching things that have got antifreeze on them now, but I'm still getting greasy antifreezy fingers. Right, that's tightened up, that's fitted. Now it's got a matter of reapplying or reattaching all the different pipes. So there's one on the front, a little tea piece at the bottom, full of juice, goopy juice. And we've got one on the back. That's on there, just tighten up in a second, and this one on the top, and the big one on the front. Oh, this engine bay needs a proper detail type thing, but urgently. Ow, my hand's stuck, and I can't get down. One down, just want to work from the back forward so I don't block myself off with more pipes. There we go, the one down here, which is only accessible upside down with a socket drive. Little sensor, temperature sensor. Let's clippity doo dah that little fella back in there. This only goes one way around, so you can't mess it up even if you try. 
it's just now the big one on the front and then we are sorted. Much easier the second time round. First go, when I did this three years ago, I wound up taking the battery out. No need this time, as I've now realised how it's all going to work. Oh, I'll just type my <laughs> glove to the thing. Now the only question left is do I have any of the pink drink? I've got loads of the blue stuff in here. I know in the barn I've got about 10, 15 litres of the stuff because all the Rover K series is use it. Um, have I got any over here? I'm not sure I have. Ooh, oh, it's got a child safe lid, I can't get into it. Yes, I do have some red uh, coolant. This is stuff I bought in Birmingham when the 200VI was pooping its pants um, up at the uh, NEC. So we've come full circle. We didn't lose too much, I don't think. But once I've got this topped up, I'll fire it up and let it run through. Check for any leaks, of course. Right, let's let this cycle through. It's gonna to have to get hot, obviously. And that could take a minute. It's not on fire, whoops. It's not on fire, that's the coolant burning off the exhaust. While it warms up, and I keep an eye on things, I just had a genius slash crazy moment thought about the Mini. I was changing the front left wheel because that's what the diagnostic machine said. I'm assuming front left means sitting in the driver's seat front left. What if it means front left from looking at the front bumper? And I've just changed the wrong wheel. That's actually an option. What I can do, I can jack the car up. <coughs> that doesn't smell nice. What I can do, I can jack the other side of the car up. I can spin the front wheel with the code reader attached and it'll give me an MPH readout and that'll tell me if I changed the right sensor or not. Meanwhile, that is now burning off the uh, leaked out coolant. That's got hot quite quickly. And here over this side, it is cycling coolant through already. And the level has dropped just down to just slightly above minimum, having I left it just above max when I started. So brilliantly, I managed to not record the actual experiment and did record packing everything away. But it turns out, yes, this wheel sensor was recording speed, so I did change the right one. Right, so while I wait patiently for the thermostat to open and the fan to kick in so I know everything's working perfectly on this, sounds like it probably is because the water, well, the coolant is cycling through there quite happily, I'm going to say goodbye. Next time the Mini comes back on the channel, we'll either be having with a fresh MOT and I'll have taken it to the garage and said, your problem, or I'll have finally figured out what the problem actually is. But, hmm, so much for a nice, quick, easy fix. It's never quite a nice, quick, easy fix, is it? I mean, this time it looks like it might have been, although it was less of an easy fix because I changed it once already and it nearly left me stranded in Birmingham. So, semi-easy fix, I guess. Anyway, thank you for watching. If you haven't already liked or subscribed, then please do. Believe it or not, it makes a massive difference. The number of views my videos get depend significantly on the number of times people click like or subscribe to the channel. It's a mad thing, but the algorithm is all about that kind of stuff. Well, join me again next time because I've got lots to do on the MX-5. I've got more to do on the Rover V8, which is over there. I've got the Rover 2000 in the garage waiting to be worked on and the Crown Vic behind you and the BMW 123. Loads of content waiting to happen. Just waiting for the rain to stop. Oh, and I have been doing a lot on the old 1969 Mini as well, but you know, not quite enough to make a full video yet. So bear with, that'll be coming soon as well. Thank you for watching. At least we've got one more car back on the road again. Mm -hmm.